The uh, reading this, this evening is on Southwest Virginia in the American Revolution. The seeds of revolution were sown by the French and Indian War. In, seven, in the 1740s, King George II became concerned at the progress that the French were making in settling in and in controlling North America. They controlled not only the St. Lawrence, but also the valleys of the Allegheny, Monongahela, Ohio, Tennessee, Cumberland, Kanawha, and Mississippi rivers. They were cultivating relationships with the Indians with far greater success than the English. The notable exceptions were the Iroquois and the Cherokee, whom the British courted with significant success. Western Virginia was therefore surrounded on three sides by the French presence in the Greenbrier Valley, the Kanawha New River Valley, and even at present Nashville on the Cumberland, and a trading post on the French Broad River east of Knoxville. England also had three other problems in King George's mind. Many excess Scots, Irish, and German pietists, religious refugees, all of whom had troublesome religious views. His solution to all these problems was to fill the land west of the Blue Ridge with these heretics, whom were often referred to as the offscourings of the earth. Like Henry Wolves, they would devour the French and the Indians, all the while providing a buffer zone to protect the English settlement east of the mountains. King George II set up two land companies in Virginia to facilitate this process, the Ohio Company and the Loyal Company. Colonial Virginia passed legislation to implement this policy, which is commonly referred to as the Cornwright Law. It was a model for the later National Homestead Act. Western land could be obtained for little or nominal money. This policy was very successful and rapidly brought the English into conflict with the French and Indians. Settlement progressed rapidly in all the valleys mentioned above and warfare with the Indians became a given constant. Formal war broke out in 1754 and the northern Indians, such as the Shawnee, Mingo, Delaware, Wyandotte, ravaged the Virginia frontier. The Cherokee allied themselves with the English. When it was formally over in 1763, England had won the war, but at great economic and psychological expense. King George III had assumed the throne in 1760 and blamed the Americans for the war, and he became determined to make the Americans pay for it. To placate the Indians and to ensure that it would never happen again, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the formal fighting, sought to guarantee to the Indians all the land west of the New River. All settlement was to be forever confined to the territory east of that river. All American settlers were required to abandon their settlements west of the New River, known as the Line of Demarcation. There was to be no reimbursement for the monies paid to the Crown for that land. There was no plan to deal with the population pressure to push the frontier to the west. Enforcement was arbitrary. For example, a portion of the lead mines in Austinville, which at that time lay west of the New River, were kept open. Traders with the Indians passed back and forth freely and often lived half the time with the Indians. To ensure good behavior, the Indians frequently required the traders to marry polygamously within their tribes. Many unhappy frontiersmen moved from Virginia to what is now Tennessee 
in the land that the English had designated as Indian Territory and declared themselves to be outside English jurisdiction. This ambiguity was exacerbated by a major error in the location of the line between North Carolina, which is now Tennessee, and Virginia, which extended to a swath lying from Gate City, Virginia, to Sevierville, Tennessee. It was frequently referred to as Squabble State. This situation was exacerbated in 1771 when the settlers of the Yadkin Valley of North Carolina got into a pitched battle with the colonial government. And as a result, hangings and burnings of public buildings were commonplace and the rebels were driven from that colony. Due to that surveying era, many who had come uh, to Squabble State thinking that they were out of North Carolina were actually still in it. This collection of events is termed the Regulator Revolt and caused the largest mass migration in colonial America. Thousands poured into Cherokee land west of the land of demarcation, adding to the population that was forming in Squabble State. Virginia had been in more or less constant war with the Indians since 1607. It had evolved a formal military structure that looked surprisingly modern in retrospect. The governor was its head. Every able-bodied man, with some official exceptions, was required to serve. The command structure was hierarchical, with the individual units usually being defined by counties, which themselves often were the greater river valleys. In peacetime, all members were required to attend four company musters, one battalion muster, and one regimental muster annually. In time of war, each militiaman had to spend a month each year in one of the forts. In 1774, the Shawnee of Ohio became upset enough over the violations of the Treaty of Paris that they attempted to invade the New River Valley. A division of the Shawnee called the Cherokee Shawnee, which included the future great Tecumseh, had lived among the Cherokee. The Cherokee broke their allegiance with the Virginia militia, as they had uh, during the French and Indian War, and remained neutral. The governor, Lord Dunsmore, ordered that the frontier be fortified. The strategic plan acknowledged the fact that most of the settlements were in Holston Valley. The militia believed in a forward defense. The plan, therefore, was to construct forts in the Clinch Valley at the northern end of the passes in Clinch, uh, Clinch Mountain that led into Holston Valley. The most important of these were Glade Hollow at Lebanon, Russell's Fort and Moore's Fort at the two fords of the Clinch at Castlewood, Fort Blackmore north of Moccasin Gap, Carter's Fort at Fry Cove. The Shawnee were defeated at the Battle of Point Pleasant where the Kanawha River flows into the Ohio in Lord Dunmore's War. The Cherokee did not participate. In 1775, the American Revolution broke out. The British developed a two-part plan to prosecute their goal to subdue the rebellious colonies. Their army would occupy the major ports along the coast where the Royal Navy could supply and protect them. Secondly, the British would incite and supply the interior Indians to attack the settlements to keep them from assisting the rebel army that was attacking the British along the coasts. Due to the marked pressures being applied to the Cherokee in East Tennessee, 
by the regulators and by the squabble staters, the Cherokees sided with the British, who had promised to keep settlers out of their country. It was a very painful split as the settlers and the Cherokee were very intermarried. It was, in fact, a civil war on the frontier. The plan of attack on the Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee frontier was for the British operating out of, the, out of Detroit and their allies, the Shawnee, to wipe out the Kentucky settlements. The combined forces of the Cherokee and frontier loyalists were to make simultaneous attacks on the Wilderness Road in Lee County and to sever this umbilical cord which connected Kentucky with Virginia, wipe out the squabble state settlement centered around Sycamore Shoals, which is Elizabethan, Tennessee, and Sevierville, and to roll up the settlements in the Holston Valley. This would restore the line of demarcation. July the 19th, 70, 1776, was the coordinated date for the onset of the three-point offensive. It should be noted that the Wilderness Road was the main Indian trail east of the Mississippi and ran from the Iroquois in the Mohawk Valley of New York, more or less parallel to modern Interstate 81 to Kingsport, Tennessee, where it veered off on US 58 to Kentucky. It became the main route of migration to the Midwest from the main port at Philadelphia. It is sometimes called the Boone Trail because he blazed that portion of the road and trail that ran from the Anderson Blockhouse in East Carter's Valley, Virginia to Boonesboro, Kentucky in 1775. To its dismay, the Virginia militia found that its forts were facing to the north to defend against the Shawnee Indians instead of south towards the Cherokee. The one exception was Fort Patrick Henry at Kingsport, whose earlier version, Fort Robinson, had been constructed during the French and Indian War. It was used as the command center for a new chain of forts designed to protect the Wilderness Road to Kentucky, which they constructed in the winter of 1775-1776. These included Rocky Station at Dot, Mumps Fort at Jonesville, Martin's Upper Station at Rose Hill, Owen Station and Park Spring near Taylor in western Lee County. To go back in time, we will pick up another thread of the story. In about 1760, a man of English descent from Tidewater, Virginia, named Trader John Binge, began making trips to the Overhill Cherokee of East Tennessee. He was so well received by the Cherokee that they married him into the tribal royalty to a woman whose English name was Elizabeth Watts. And soon a son was born who was named Bob. His uncles were tribal chiefs. Like many Cherokee marriages, this union did not last long. Cherokee society was matrilineal, and all a woman had to do to divorce a man was to set his moccasins outside the door. Somewhere along 1769 to 1772, Elizabeth Binge married William Dorton Sr., likely of English descent, in the Adkin Valley of North Carolina. They moved to Castlewood, Virginia, then to Copper Ridge, south of Dickinsonville. Bob went to live with the Dortons, but he seemed to have been a troubled teenager. 
He often ran away to his uncles in Tennessee, who were named Pumpkin Boy, Man Killer, whose other name, nickname, was Doublehead, and Old Tassel. His mother would send her son by William, who was named Moses, to bring him back home. The Dortons maintained a fort on Copper Ridge, which served as a link between the forts of Castlewood and the Upper Clinch, and those in the valley of Big Moccasin Creek. Lord Dunmore's War has been called the first battle of the Revolution. That conceptualization is not far off. It reignited the conflicts between the Indians and the settlers, placed the British colonial government of Virginia at odds with its citizenry, and started a realignment of the allegiances among the Indians. The next year, the revolution broke out, and in the headwaters of the Tennessee River, at least, it is best described as a civil war. It split both the settlers and the Cherokee, who ultimately sided with the British. The British plan to prosecute the war was implemented. They divided the, uh, this operationally into northern and southern departments. Kentucky fell into the area of responsibility of the northern department, which was centered in Detroit and allied mostly with the Shawnee. Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee fell into the Southern Department, controlled from Pensacola, in which allied itself with the Cherokee. West Florida, including Pensacola, belonged to Britain at that time. The Apalachicola River provided direct passage to the Cherokee at Chattanooga. The practical implementation of this plan was to attack the Kentucky settlements by the Northern Department and to sever the umbilical cord connecting Kentucky and Virginia and to run out the settlements of the Powell, Clinch, and Holson Valleys, thusly restoring the line of demarcation. And all this was to be done by the Southern Department. D-Day was to be July the 19th, 1776. The Cherokee, along with hundreds of American Tories, simultaneously struck western Lee County near Park Spring, which is Kaler, Fort Lee at Sycamore Shoals, Elizabethan, the main fork of the Holston at Long Island Flats, Kingsport, the Lee County campaign resulted in the evacuation of all the forts that had been built there the previous winter, except for the blockhouse at Rocky Station, which is Dot. The attack at Fort Lee went on for weeks and technically ended in a failure, except for the practical effect that many of the settlers retreated to Black's Fort at Abington. The attack at Long Island Flats started as a classic European-style battle of formations, infantry, and Tory cavalry. The Indians had no taste for standing up in the open and getting killed, so the battle ended in their defeat. However, again, the practical result was more favorable to the British. The Cherokee held council and decided to ignore their British advisors and to break up into small individual parties who would sow terror among the settlements. The results were nearly completely successful. Hundreds of settlers evacuated the river bottoms of the Holston and barricaded themselves into Black's Fort. The end result was that the Cherokee did succeed in clearing out the settlements of the major portion of the Holston Valley. But the presence of a large armed garrison at Abington 
present, prevented them from going all the way to the New River. The umbilical cord to Kentucky was nearly cut. Only parties of about 40 or more were relatively safe in making that passage. Boonesboro and Harrodsburg in Kentucky, which had been settled under Daniel Boone's influence, were attacked by the Shawnee under a French-Canadian commander who was working for the British. The situation was desperate. Three messengers were dispatched in the middle of a night to go plea for help from the Holston militia. They reached Carter's Fort at Rye Cove, which was under siege itself. Two of the messengers were killed trying to gain entry into the fort, but the third made it in and gave the alarm. A relief party of militia broke through the siege at Rykov's fort, made the 150 mile trip to Boonesboro in two and a half days, lifted the siege there and saved Kentucky. This happened at least once again and possibly four more times. We need to pause a moment and to realize that this action saved the possibility of American settlement of the continent west of the Virginia and the Alleghenies. If it had not happened, the rest of the United States as it exists today most likely it would have been a foreign country, either British, Spanish, or Indian. From the Loyalists' perspective, Rico Fort had to go. Much to everyone's surprise, this little outpost in the middle of nowhere proved to be the linchpin that held the future United States together. General Joseph Martin, whose home was in Martinsville, Virginia, which was named after him, was in command of the Holston Militia, whose headquarters were at Fort Patrick Henry in Kingsport. He tried to take the garrison from there to the relief of Fort Rakove, but the Cherokee had Moccasin Gap closed. Martin then tried to go to Rye Cove by its back door, Little Moccasin Gap, which also had been garrisoned by the Cherokee. The militia forced its way through and reinforced Carter's fort. A long siege with frequent sorties resulted. It became obvious that Rye Cove defended the back door to Black's Fort and was what prevented the complete evacuation of the Holston Valley all the way back to Radford. The New River Militia under the command of Colonel William Christian came to the relief of the Holston Militia who were barricaded up in Black's Fort and at Rye Cove. Under this umbrella of protection, the Holston Militia was able to reassemble itself into a functioning unit, and the two militias met at Kingsport, which was the headwaters of navigation on the Holston at what was then called the Boat Yards, which was located at the present Netherland Inn and built a flotilla of rafts and of dugout canoes. In October, half the force embarked downstream in this flotilla and the other half went on foot. They attacked the Cherokee towns between the French Broad River and the Little Tennessee River and did to them what Sherman did in a later war to Georgia. There was very little left. There is no record of what role Bob Binge played in all this. It is obvious that during these events, he decided he was fully and completely Cherokee. 
His hometown of Tokwa was burned for the first time. He obviously became schooled in the Indian tactics of terror. The Overhill Cherokee divided into peace and war factions, with Benj joining the war faction that settled in the Chattanooga and Chickamauga area. Whether Benj's behavior was determined by testosterone, cultural identity issues, or perhaps by a bipolar gene that may have run through the family as evidenced by Uncle Doublehead is food for thought. It is no surprise that in April 1777, Bob Benge found himself along with a party of Cherokee teenagers in Clinch Valley, hell-bent on causing terror in the valley of his earlier life. Fort Blackmore controlled the intersection of the Clinch Valley branch of the Wilderness Road to Kentucky, and the trail running north and south that connected the Cherokee with the Shawnee. Benj attacked the fort, sowing consternation, and then went up the valley to Moore's Fort in Lower Castlewood, and then made his escape to the Shawnee of Ohio, passing Gist's Fort at Coburn on the way. This proved to be a pattern for most of the raids until his death. Come into the settlements by one route, exit by another, and his close cooperation with the Cherokee Shawnee who had returned home to Ohio. To put Benj on a back burner for a while, let us follow the development of the Revolutionary War from the perspective of the Holston Militia. Following the Battle of Point Pleasant, some of the militia returned home to the news of the Siege of Boston. They just kept right on marching and joined those events in New England. William Russell of Castlewood became a general in the Continental Line. The British gave up on their suppressing the rebellion in the North and late in 1779 moved to the South under the command of General Cornwallis. In 1780, he started north towards Virginia. He protected his western flank with English troops under Tarleton, who protected his flank with a formation of red-coated loyalists from New Jersey and New York under the command of the Englishman Captain Patrick Ferguson. Ferguson made the mistake of threatening the Overhill militias with verbiage recalling the assault of the red-coated forces of the colony of North Carolina against the Regulators in 1771. It had the opposite of the intended effect. The militia swarmed into the Carolinas and annihilated Ferguson and his command at the Battle of Kings Mountain in South Carolina. In doing so, the Overmountain militias withstood repeated bayonet charges made downhill against them by the Redcoats. This was unheard of. No army in the world stood up to a Redcoats bayonet charge. This led Richard Henry Lee to say that the Holston militia was the finest light infantry in the world. The British and the Continental Line rushed toward each other and collided at Cowpens, South Carolina. The battle was to take place in a narrow valley with the British charging the American forces. There were not enough of the Continental Line to plug the hole across the valley. The Holston Militia was chosen to fill that gap. Together, the Continental Line and the Holston Militia withstood the Redcoat Charge, and Cornwallis was forced to go to Yorktown, where he expected succor from the British Navy. It was not to happen. 
Cornwallis was forced to surrender in 1781. The peace treaty was not signed until 1783. In the meantime, the Cherokee and the Overmountain militias continued to fight it out. The line between North Carolina and Virginia was resurveyed in 1780, and the excuse for Squabble State went away. The former Squabble Staters still lived in Northeast Tennessee, and their attitudes had not changed. To drop back and pick up on the binge story, in 1780, the Chickamaugans decided to attack the settlements while the militia men were away at Kings Mountain. The men from Kings Mountain made it back in time and met the Ch Cherokee at the Battle of Boyge Creek near Sevierville. Benji's hometown of Toqua was burned a second time. His wife and his children had been there. The peace treaty ending the Revolutionary War came in 1783. Its terms guaranteed the Cherokee their land. This left the squabble staters in limbo. So in 1784, they formed the state of Franklin, which they viewed as an independent country. They bought the former squabble state land from the Cherokee. The United States did not recognize the state of Franklin and tried to enforce the terms of the treaty that they had signed with the British. In 1783, William Dorton, Benj's stepfather, was killed by Indians while he was fighting with the militia. The specifics of what Bob Benj was doing during this period of time are not known. Whatever they were, they were sufficient for his half-brother, Moses, to move to Kentucky and to change his name to Dalton. Old trader John Benj died at his home with the Chickamauga Cherokee. The fighting in the Overhill settlements intensified. In 1784, the state of Franklin was formed defying the American government in its signing of the peace treaty with the British the year before, and which had guaranteed the Cherokee their lands. The state of Franklinders attacked brutally the Cherokee. Binge led the militia into mousetrap ambushes and gave them their only defeats in their history. Retaliation and counter-retaliations were the rule of the day. They were so constant and so numerous that their names are not even known today. In 1785, Benj came into Virginia via Kentucky and was upset to find Wallens Creek in Lee County to have been settled. He attacked the home there of Archibald and Fanny Scott and killed all but Fanny, whom he took to Ohio with him. She was to make her escape and return to the settlements. She lived a long life and is buried in Elk Garden. In 1788, John Sevier led the militia on attack of the Cherokee towns along the Hiawassee River, and Benj led the rear guard against them. In June, Old Tassel was murdered by the settlers while he was under a flag of truce. Due to this and to pressure from the United States, the state of Franklin collapsed. John Sevier was convicted of treason by a federal court. These explosive tensions provoked more violence. 
At this point, one can discern a subtle shift in Benj's tactics. His forays had started out as implementations of the Cherokee strategy of sowing general unfocused terror. This policy evolved into one of focused political hits against specific officers of the Holston militia. One wishes that we knew more about specifically who among the militia was responsible for the mayhem they were conducting in the Cherokee country. In 1790, Benj led a targeted hit against that family of Isaac Newland at Mongol Spring on the North Fork of the Holston. Isaac's wife and infant child were killed. Isaac was an officer in the Holston militia. In 1791, Benj attacked the McDowell family and the Ferris family at Gate City, Virginia. It is not known what roles these men had played in the attacks on the Cherokee settlements. In 1792, Benj conducted raids on Buchanan's Fort and the Ratliff family at Nashville. Big Aaron, a highly regarded warrior, was killed at Pine Mountain, Kentucky, which is on the Cumberland. In 1793, which opened with Doublehead laying an ambush at Dripping Springs, which is this side of Bowling Green, Kentucky, the settlers who just happened by were Captain William Overall and a man named Burnett. The Indians killed the two, and then with great premeditation and discussion on the potential terror value of their attack, they cannibalized them. Later that year, George Washington was trying to force peace on the Cherokee and the Overmountain militias. Peace commissioners headed by Major Thomas King, dispatched by the national government, met with leaders of the peace faction of the Overhill Cherokee. While this was happening, Doublehead attacked the settlements near Knoxville and killed Thomas and James Gillum. The militia under Captain John Beard pursued the party of Doublehead right into the midst of the peace conference in the middle of the night and shot up the place, killing and wounding several of both the peace commissioners and the peace faction of the Cherokee. Even though Doublehead met with George Washington, the peace efforts were derailed and thousands, a thousand Cherokee warriors invaded Knoxville where Pumpkin Boy was killed. That year, Benj attacked Ferris's station at Gate City and killed several, including a Livingston woman. Though the exact year it happened is unknown, the likely one is also 1793. Benji's brother, the tail, killed the breeding family at Holmes Mill, Kentucky. Bob Benj was not inactive. March the 31st, he ambushed Moses Ensign Cockrell and Kane's Gap between Duffield and Scott Station. The two men were each icons within their communities and often bragged about their eagerness to fight each other. All of Cockerell's companions were killed, but he himself escaped to the protection of the fort at the head of Wallens Creek. The grand climax of this long story began in 1794. In another of his targeted hits, Benj focused on four officers of the Holston militia, the two sons of William Todd Livingston, who were Henry, nicknamed Harry, and Lieutenant Peter Livingston, who lived near Mendota and Major James Fulkerson and Peter Fulkerson 
of Hilton's Virginia. On April the 6th, the widowed mother of the sons was killed, along with some of the slaves. The new brides of Harry and Peter were carried off toward Hilton's and the home of the Fulkersons. There was a barn raising in progress, and too many men were present to admit an attack. The binge party took off through the westernmost of the two Hamilton Gaps in Clinch Mountain. That night, they camped in a secret cove below a waterfall on Benches Creek in the center of Copper Ridge. The morning of the 7th, they passed down Benches Creek, which they waited to prevent detection. Fortunately, Eliza Jane Addington, a little girl who lived where the creek crosses the road down the southern bank of the Clinch River, saw a wet moccasin track on a rock in the middle of the creek and realized what it was. She alerted the militia, who regrouped themselves and started after the party of Binge. That party had crossed the Clinch west of Dungannon on a fish trap dam. They made their way up Big Stony Creek to Camp Rock, and on top, which is on top of Powell Mountain, where they rested for the night of the 7th. The previous year, a militiaman named Vincent Hobbs, Jr. had become alarmed at the depredations of Binge. He was part of a large clan that lived just upstream from the Livingstons. Next up the North Fork of the Holston was Benham's Fort, owned by John Benham. All three of these families were intermarried. The Hobbses, who simultaneously maintained homes at Dryden, Virginia, and at Benham, had hunting camps on top of Black Mountain and the Benham Spur. Then there was that Livingston woman whom Binge had killed at Ferris' station the year before. Hobbs seemed to have been intellectually challenged, even perhaps insulted, that Binge could slip in and out of Hobbs' backyard with such impunity. Hobbs spent the next winter walking the mountains until he had discovered all the passes that Binge had used. He felt certain that Binge would be back the next year, and Hobbs developed a plan to catch him. As Binge's escape routes had several different variations, the militia had to block all of them. Each garrison was assigned a specific task. Hobbs was part of a special forces group of rapid deployment spies, or scouts, that was stationed at Yoakum Station south of Dryden. They were the elite of the militiamen. The plan he designed was that when the North Fork of the Holston was attacked again, a messenger was to go to Benham's Fort from there, messengers were to be sent to Dorton's Fort on Copper's Ridge and to Yoakum Station. Then part of the garrison of Penham's Fort was to march through the night to Yoakum Station. The garrison at Dorton's Fort was to march to the head ford of the Kentucky River at Whitesburg, Kentucky, where they were to interdict any attempts at escape down that river to the Ohio. The combined forces of Yoakum Station and of Benham's Fort were to rush to Benj's Gap that connects Benj's Branch with Hudal Hala, which is shown on the current maps as Carding Machine Branch and is near Norton, which was the central corridor of Benj's habitual escape routes. This area afforded Binge the choices of either going through 
winding gap at Pound Jenkins, where he had again a choice of going to Elkhorn City and on to the Ohio at Ashland, or down the Kentucky River starting at Whitesburg, or going on through Littlestone Gap to Ben's Branch, which is a modern day corruption of Benji's Branch at Appalachia, and on through to Benji's Gap, which is a modern Morris's Gap at Keoki, Virginia, and on down the Cumberland to Chickamauga. The remainder of the garrison of Benham's Fort was to attempt to track the Indian party as they made their escape. Sure that he had once again escaped the militia and being exhausted from the raid, Benjamin party relaxed the night of the 7th at Camp Rock. They were lazy about getting up the next morning and just made it down to somewhere in the general area of the present Norton Reservoir before they again camped for the night of the 8th. Binge sent out two scouts to go on to Appalachia, where they were to set up camp and to kill and to prepare supper for the camp of the Knights. In the meantime, Vincent Hobbs Jr. and his party passed through Big Stone Gap, and the evening of the 8th found them in Appalachia. They saw the smoke coming from the scouts' campfire and killed both. Either late that evening or the early the next morning, they went up Benji's Branch and across Little Stone Mountain to Little Stone Gap, and the morning of the 9th began the descent into Hood El Hala. There, Hobbs divided his force and sent half of it through Benji's Gap to a rock fin that nearly comes to blocking the hollow towards Norton. That rock commonly today is known as Benji's Rock. The party of Benji and the party of militia collided on the side of the little hollow that branches off of Hoodow Hollow and leads to Little Stone Gap. They, the destroyed Second Benji's Rock, which it was destroyed by the construction of the four lane US 23, stood there. Benj was shot and killed April the 9th, 1794. The Livingston women were rescued, and the pursuing party from Benham's Fort soon came up from behind them. The spot is now buried under the road fill of US 23 between Littlestone Gap and Hood El Hala. Some of Benji's party escaped the ambush and retreated to Benji's branch, where the party at the second Benji's rock killed all but three. These three were interdicted by the garrison of Dorton's Fort at the ford of the Kentucky River near Whitesburg and killed two. Only one Indian survived the Livingston Raid. This was the last Indian fighting in Virginia and the last significant fighting with the Cherokee in the entire country. Most significantly, it was the real end of the Revolutionary War. It removed the last impediment to Western expansion. The cork had been removed from the bottle, never to be replaced. Manifest destiny was unleashed with explosive force. The Livingston brides returned home where they lived out their lives and are buried in the family graveyard on a hilltop overlooking the lovely North Fork. Southwest Virginia has many of their descendants. Vincent Hobbs Jr. moved to Central Tennessee. 
the Hobbs family still live on the North Fork of the Holston and along the Powell River around Dryden. Bob Binge has many descendants scattered across the country. King George II's view that the Germans and Scotch-Irish you put into the Valley of Virginia would consume all who stood against them was more prophetic than he realized. They took the first British Empire out in the process. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to field any questions that anybody might have. I know what you're saying. I think I would call it on a spur of Copper Ridge. Yeah. It's not the main, the main ridge as you imply, but I think that, that I would call it a spur of Copper Ridge. I don't know about the route number, but the, the road that you described is true. It goes by Glen Carter Store, K, and on up to uh, Camp Rock. Um, Kaler was Park Spring. Park Spring. Okay. You know where that big uh, municipal water supply is in an old abandoned rock quarry? Yep. Yep. That's Park Spring. Okay. That's important because at one time that was the westernmost uh, station in Virginia of the, of the militia. And Daniel Boone was in command there. And we have a copy of a letter that he wrote to the governor of Virginia asking that uh, the uh, post be moved on down to Martin's Lower Station because there wasn't enough water there at that spring. Uh, it's a very lovely letter, which is important because even the video that they have showing at Martin Station and the Cumberland Gap National Historic Park will tell you that Daniel Boone was illiterate. It's not true. He, had, he was a creative speller, but the man wrote a wonderful, exquisite letter of supplication is what I was taught to call it when I was in high school to the governor. It was eloquent. He was not illiterate. And the man, despite what you may have been taught, knew how to spell his name. <laughs> the E was always there. If you ever see Daniel Boone kill the bar on this tree and there's no E on the end, that's a forgery. Thank you all for your kind attention.